Hi, welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. We, Pebbles and I, and Homer, are here with Patrick Sheridan on the campus of Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana at uh, iTech 2014, where it all began. Indeed. In the office of trombone professor Pete Ellison. Thanks, Pete, for the use of your office. Patrick. Yeah, we'll let it slide. Hey, man, good to see you. Great to see you. Great to see you. Wonderful, wonderful hearing you again last night with the Thank Boston you. Brass. Thank really you. phenomenal. It's great. Thanks. Takes me back. Mm. It takes me back to uh, 1986 at Northwestern when you were playing this uh, set as an 18 year old in the Norris Student Union Bar mm -hmm. at Northwestern, entertaining the crowd, mainly the ladies, for <coughs> an hour with your tuba. That's how I got into music. That was impressive. That's how I got into music. When I was in kindergarten, the sixth grade jazz band was playing on stage, so this is like, you know, 1973, just playing Yellow Submarine and uh -huh. Tijuana Taxi. And uh, we were, I was in the front because we were in kindergarten, and they, they finished whatever piece they were playing, the, the jazz band, and uh, every girl in the gym stood up. So every day until fourth grade when I got in the band, I asked my band director, my future band director, hey, I need to get in the band. What for? I have the ladies. I got to get in right away. So. That was my motivation at the beginning. Man, <laughs> I didn't have that same path. <laughs> and also uh, study with Mr. Jacobs. Yes. Um, uh, just can you can you take us back? Uh, what was the your first encounter with Mr. Jacobs like? What 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 was that all about? Sure. Um, well, I, the first time I heard him um, uh, was uh, live uh, was 1984 here at Indiana University at the Brass Congress, mm -hmm. and he had a session and uh, he played. I was telling Jeff Connor last night he. I remember sitting in the, 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 the first balcony on the side of the Musical Arts Center at the MAC, and uh, he played, uh, on his York, he played uh, Green Sleeves. Yes, right. But way up in the upper register, and it was, like, it was haunting. And I never heard anything like that before. Yeah. I never heard anything like I heard that entire week in 1984 at the Brass Congress. Right. I was uh, just finished my sophomore year in high school, so I was, yeah. you know, it was pretty amazing. And uh, I met John Fletcher that week, and all, uh, I was like, all these tube luminaries uh, were here, and um, uh, so that was the first time I got to meet him, and that was when I met Jerry Young for the first time, and John Stevens for the first time, and Jerry actually took me over and introduced me to him, Great, you know, and said, this is, you know, Mr. Jacobs, and he plays in Chicago Symphony, so next time you're in Chicago, you have to hear the orchestra, and, you know, I, was, I didn't really know at that point, I was like, was it, is that a good orchestra, you know? <laughs> Talking to Jerry, is any good? You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, and then in 1985, uh, 86, my my last year in uh, high school, I got a chance to go down. Mm, I don't know, five six times uh, each quarter or each semester uh, to take a lesson with him and hear the symphony. And and was getting ready to go to to Northwestern. Uh, my the last week of Interlochen uh, in my after my junior year, I had John Painter. Yeah. And then they started this uh, John P. Painter scholarship. And I was the winner in 1986, and he brought me out to play with the North Shore Band. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, that that time I was there for a whole week, so I got a chance to, to see Mr. Jacobs several times in a row and uh, sort of solidify the <clears throat> the idea that I was going to go to Northwestern University and study with him on the side because he didn't teach at the school. Right, and he stopped after that. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but that was the that was my my sort of the beginning of it, and the, you know, the story that I tell everybody all the time it, it included those 12, 13 lessons my senior year and then for the first four months of, of, of uh, studying with him, I played the uh, da 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 Sounds better. Right, exactly. And uh, always in the, it was on my C2, but always the key C. My very first lesson I went in and I played the Von Williams Tuba Concerto and the Hindemith Sonata from memory. And he looked to me and he's like, that's great. Now get your C2 out and we'll learn how to play the tuba. And I was like, <laughs> what? He's like, yeah. And I picked it up and I played it. He's like, yeah, you sound exactly the same. I'm like, well, it's the tuba. And he's like, and he picks up his tuba, and then I was like, oh, oh. Right? He played for you. Yeah, right there. On your tuba. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, what? So uh, 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 the whole first parts of the, le the senior year and then the first part of my freshman year, it was it was 100% approach. If the breath wasn't right, I didn't get to play the first note. And most of the time, I only got to play, and he'd stop me. And go, okay, now, the second note, and it was, and it, it was like, it was very micro um, and it was super frustrating for a teenager yes I was pissed at him all the time right almost every lesson I would leave just like when are we gonna move on when are we gonna move on and uh, but I and I didn't didn't get what I was getting 
I was more progressing, but I didn't get what I was doing. I didn't understand that I was learning how to make a perfectly resonant sound on every single note all the way up for two octaves and another fifth below the C, below yeah. the staff, right? Yeah. I didn't understand that. I just was doing a stupid exercise and thought, when are we going to move on? And uh, so one day I finally, I lost it in the lesson. I was in the lesson at the Fine Arts Building, and I was like, okay, Mr. Jacobs, I, got, I just, when are we going to do music? You know, I came to Northwestern, and I came come to hear the orchestra every week. I go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I go, I go every day. You know, and thanks for the free tickets, by the way, Mr. Jacobs. And but like, when I'm going to play some excerpts, I want to play some burials, I want to play some stuff. You know, and he's like, he looks at me, he's sort of confused, and he goes, Well, what would you like to play? And I was like, Well, how about the Hungarian March? And he goes, Go ahead. So I played it down, and I get to the end, and he, he had two little comments. You know, the E's a little sharp, and. The time was a little bit bad right here in the middle. And he looked at me and he goes, we well, play it again. And I played it again. And he gets done and he goes, that was wonderful. I'd hire you for that. <laughs> the light bulb still didn't go off. And I looked at him and was like, well, I don't understand. Why are we doing this other thing all the time? He's like, well, because that's delivering that. He says, do you remember your first lesson? And I was like, yeah, I played the minute bottom. He said, yeah, you already played harder music than you're going to encounter in an orchestra. So i got to get you to sound like you belong in an orchestra. That's what we're doing. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Duh. And uh, dope. And uh, uh, so uh, I, uh, I, uh, that was it. Then I really got it at that point. I just went Whoa, in terms of my uh, progress every week because I understood what he was getting at and that it was approach, 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 approach. It wasn't that exercise. It wasn't that Rochu. It wasn't that Charlier. It was what am I supposed to be thinking about when I'm doing it? So that was the, 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 the sort of the, the, the intro of it. And then when I got to Northwestern after those first lessons and I showed up to my first lesson, Luckily, we, you could register by telephone then. Um, he wouldn't let me uh, uh, take the first lesson once I was a student at Northwestern. And I was like, well, why not? He said, well, I have my own requirements. And I was like, well, what's that? He's like, well, you have to take every anatomy class that they'll allow you to take. And when they stop allowing you to take anatomy classes, you let me know who I need to call, and I'll call them, and you'll get into the class. He said, so you need to register for Anatomy 101 right now. And I said, OK, what else? And he goes, choir. You need to be in a choir. I don't care which one at Northwestern, but you need to be in a choir. I won't teach you unless you show me registration for a choir. So I registered for both classes over the phone, we had our lesson, and then every semester for the next the next semester and then the next year, I was just there for my two years, first two years of college, um, <coughs> he would always check. Mm -hmm. First first lesson of the quarter, let me see your registration, show it to him. Good. And that was his message of like, year, mm -hmm. year, and see it, say it, read it, make it a language, you know? And, uh, um, and then the anatomy part was, you know, I, I liked it. And uh, he knew that I had, I was doing the Northwestern thing like uh, Bob Carpenter was doing the, um, the double yeah. bachelor's. Yeah, yeah. So the, the Bachelor of Science and the Bachelor of Music, and that's how I started electrical engineering. I, I didn't really get to the EE classes because I left the school before that, but uh, lots of math and lots of other science classes. So he knew I was, had that bent in my life, so he just threw that in front of me, and I, he was right. I just gobbled it up, and yeah. then like, coming to with all this information, and then I was like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with this? He's like, okay, I'm glad you asked. And then, we would go into it, so it was. Uh, it was really that, that for me. I think that was after I learned how to get understood where he was coming from, and I had enough anatomy. Then the lessons changed from this sort of student teacher thing to. Uh, I was talking his hobby mm -hmm. and his passion, and so it was really energetic and uh, and very interesting lessons, and often not, no playing, you know. I'm teaching it. It was always the other thing. Talking shop with him. Yeah, I was talking shop, and uh, and then it was, but it was also uh, he, he, Sam Palafi, and Harvey Phillips, and Arnold Jacobs. All three said the same thing to me when I was in high school when they met me, which was, "You need students. You got to get students right now. Well, I don't need to teach. You know, you need students right now. You need to explain what you're going through." Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my questions. Then I'd come to him and I go, "Okay, I'm teaching this and I'm doing this and I understand this and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, "Well, you need to teach it this way, or why don't you try it this way, or say it this way?" And and that really helped helped me as well for, for all the things I did. And then well, those lessons were usually on my freshman sophomore year, those lessons were on Saturday. And the lesson after me was Floyd, you know, <laughs> right? It was awesome. So I'd sit in the hallway and listen. And, and uh, it was almost always some famous trombone player right, right before me. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, th th that was this great thing about being in Chicago. It's yeah. This, all this classical music culture everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my lessons were on Saturday, and uh, I would always get a student rush ticket on Friday night over here at the orchestra. I'd beg him for a ticket on Saturday, and he'd always come through. And, 
and then if there was a Sunday performance, I went then, and if it was Thursday, I'd already I'd, I'd gone to that as well. Yeah. And uh, was just trying to hear it as much as possible and be in different places in the hall and sit with the score. And then, uh, but then once we sort of got to this sort of talking shop thing, then I'd see him the next lesson. And, What'd you hear? You know, what did you think of that? How did you think of that? Uh, and I, and I <laughs> never forget when I then came in with the. Uh, uh, Berlioz, Romeo, and Juliet, and I was playing it just like the Giolini recording me. <laughs> and I'd already been yelled at by Chris Voice, like, that's a terrible recording, you don't want everyone to play it like that. And I'm like, I love that! And yeah, he's like, yeah. that's not the right interpretation. And I'm like, but I love it! And he's like, stop doing it, Jacob's gonna yell at you. And I'm like, no, he's not, he's gonna love it, I'm playing the crap out of it, I'm playing it, I sound just like him. And he's yeah. like, he's gonna hate it. And I went down and I played it, and he looks at me, he's like, what are you doing that for? <laughs> you know, Mr. C warned me. You know. <laughs> But it was, it was, he was wanting to know, <clears throat> assess what I was listening to and what I was yeah. focusing on, what I was paying attention to. Sure. And um, uh, uh, so that was really, those were, that was really helpful to be, uh, sort of made me become a, more of a fan of that symphonic literature, mm -hmm. which was the, you know, at that point, those two years in my college, that's what, the only thing I was focused on. How did you, how did you deal with that, that frustration as a, as a teenager? Uh, having to go so slowly. Uh -oh. um, I, well, I, I, I had been told <laughs> by Ross Tolbert, who was a tuba player in the Minnesota Orchestra, who was my teacher right yeah. at home uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I'd been told by Jerry Young, who I'd studied with at, at Interlochen, and who's always been, uh, he like watches out for me like I'm his kid. Yeah. He's, I think he does that for everybody. But he, he's you know, a great guy. Yeah, it's wonderful. And, uh, and he told me straight up, and he's like, you're going to go down there and you're going to take lessons. And if he tells you to sit, sit upside down on a cactus and pull your teeth out, you're going to do it. Just shut up and do what he says. That's some pretty good imagery. <laughs> puddles. <laughs> you know, and that was it. I mean, I, and I was like, okay. So I didn't really deal with the frustration. I would go in and I would just was doing what Jerry Held told me to do. He said, like, go to the lesson. If there's somebody good after you, listen to it. Then go to your car, sit in the car, put the tape in the tape player, and transcribe the lesson. Then drive back to Northwestern. Then go practice. So I, I was religious about that. I have every single lesson on tape. I have all of them transcribed. I got all, all, everything for all the stuff that we did, um, and uh, which is just a good habit anyway. It is. Anybody taking yeah, a lesson, of course. Um, and uh, uh, but I was really about you know, I was being, I was being. Jerry was very powerful uh, influence in my life at that point. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to do what he says. And now nah, this is stupid, but I'm I'm going to do what he says. And and then I didn't. I, I you know, I mouthed off to Mr. Jacobs. When are we going to get to the music, Mr. Jacobs? Uh -huh. With a big grin on his face. What do you mean by that? What would you like to do? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so he, it was. Uh, he was. He was. Uh, he probably said, "Are you happy now?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I remember, you know, he made me like every little Arvin thing. We had. To, I had to come in with lyrics all the time, which was, you know, matching phonation to pitch. And yes. All these great uh, techniques that he used uh, that uh, I never really. I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I was just. Obedient, I'm like oh, okay, and then things would get better. Um, and uh, but that's the great thing about the that's the really fortunate thing for me is I've had Ross Tolbert, I had our, uh, Jerry Young, and Arnold Jacobs, and Dave Federley, and Sam Palafian, all these phenomenal Gary yeah. Offenlock, yeah. Roger Rocco, the only people that were teaching Dan Perantoni, Jim Self, the right information. And everybody gave me I got a little bit of something from all of them and. Uh, but the whole thing from Jacobs was approach and sound. Yeah. And how to make things resonate. Um, and, uh, and then making sure that... He, I remember him saying this to me. He'd say, you, you, you need to do this anatomy stuff because you're going to teach. And when you teach, you need to do no harm. You need to make sure that you're giving people the truth about their anatomy and not something other than that. And, and, uh, and he's like, because you'll hurt people. And of course, this is way before we had all this like outbreak of... You know, issues and awareness about all, yeah, all this business. But it was pretty prescient of yeah. him to be like, if you're going to teach and you're going to open your mouth about music, then you better be standing on solid scientific ground in the areas that relate to respiratory function. Right. And I took that to heart. My mom was a nurse, so it was sort of yeah. it was in the realm. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. in the sphere of, uh, of you know, my understanding. So. Patrick, did you get the feeling with Mr. Jacobs that um, he was, was there a, um, I don't know, there's, there's two ways to approach it. You have a, a specific curriculum or a general curriculum with your student. What, what did you feel like it was? Yeah, well, I, I mean, in the beginning, I, we were all, I was, everybody that was taking lessons that was sort of at the beginning of where I was developmentally, 
um, we were doing the same sort of playing for him. Um, but uh, Legacy of a Master came out, and there's all these stories about it in the machines, and then you go to the lesson, and there's all this equipment everywhere. And uh, in my more than 100 lessons, I never even turned one on. Just that one that the, the black and white TV used them. Yeah, the oscilloscope. This, the line, you know. Yeah. And that was it, nothing else. Probably for tone, and, for resonance. Yeah, that was it. And, uh, but, it but like, breathing, not, nothing, none of the other stuff. Um, we mess with the anatomy charts all the time because we were talking shop about that. But uh, the uh, uh, so I was, you know, I was like, that was a question that came up at the end. I was like, well, why, why, you know, why not this? And, and he got a big grin on his face again. And he goes, if I'd given you that, you'd have made it all about the machine. And I was like, you know that about me? And he goes, yeah, you're that's who you are. And he's like, I had to feed you the right information and keep you away from the stuff that. It's really helpful to a lot of people because you just would have obsessed about trying to make the, the ball go up mm -hmm. and missed it, you know. Yeah. And uh, and he he, he was and he's right. He read me so <clears throat> well, and maybe he was prompted by my prior teachers. So I was a bit of a wild child, um, but uh, it w that was it. I I was I would always ask, and they're like, "You didn't do this, and you didn't do this, and you didn't do this." And then, but you'd, if you talk to enough people in Regenstein about their lessons, well, they were all different. They are, and, and that was a great. Yeah. I didn't get it then, but it was a great message on. Uh, it's a great message on reflection of uh, you're going to meet your students where they're at. Exactly. You know, we're going to try to deliver a general curriculum, but you have to meet them where they come to you each day. And uh, yep. uh, and he was superb at handling me in that way and keeping me away from the things that would have I proven what I was where my point of view was at that point mm -hmm. instead of trying to move me in another direction and create different kinds of awarenesses in terms of tone and resonance. Those, those were the main things. And clarity. Clarity. But that was, the, that came later from other teachers. The main thing was the, the resonance and the sound. Yeah. Uh, and, and consistent from top to bottom. So he said, he's like, you need to sound like you when you play high and you when you play low and not five different tuba players. Right. But, uh, but I still, you know, Every once in a while, when I see Brian, I'm like, and I, I have a I also have a picture of the studio, and I go, "What was that for?" And he looked Brian, and I was like, "How do you not know that?" I'm like, "He never used any of that stuff sure. with me." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, none of the none of the gadgets and the and the equipment, and uh, uh, but that's you know in the in the end it, it's okay because I had not. He he was right in that I would have been distracted, and it's. I think he also sort of recognized the teaching style early on and that I'm not a gadget-oriented uh, person in the way I present uh, pedagogy information. Yeah. And uh, so in the lacking all of that as a tool to create awareness for my students, I had to come up with other ways to create the awareness. I think, I think also in the 90s, you know, probably the last decade or half decade, he probably, he started to realize that, that the gadgets were starting to become a focus. Yeah. Of some people around, maybe not necessarily his students, but he could he could sense that there was this gadget thing, yeah, a gadget tide. Well, we were moving in that direction as a society at that point too. Yeah. Anyway, and so um, he started to, I think he started to get away from that more and just be more simple. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, yeah, I was the eighty six to eighty five to eighty eight were the, the the years that I studied with him and. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we had a lot of discussion, too, uh, uh, when I was there about uh, free buzzing, mm -hmm. about buzzing without a rim. Oh, yeah, piece. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we would go back and forth. We went back and forth till right. 96, like the last time I saw him in Evanston, you know, and uh, before he passed away. And he was still, and he, at the end, he, he relented. He goes, how long you do it for? 45 seconds. And what's the purpose in your mind for that exercise? And mm -hmm. I explained it to him. I said, it's to, you know, to, it's to go fretless. And to anchor at the corners and not anchor at the edge of the mouthpiece, it develops a nice little bit of a of an anchoring. That yeah. you and I said you used to use that word to me all the time. Got to anchor your corners, anchor your corners. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about ever. Um, and uh, uh, and I but I found that the issues that he because I did a lot of my own problem solving. It was like the a good half of the breathing gym exercises that that are co-developed that Sam and I have done, yeah. I was doing them then to be able to deliver to him resonance. Because I, I couldn't move the kind of air that I needed to move. So I was like working out, trying to figure out how to make my body move that kind of air and, right. and, and not feel like I was working to, you know, like that was the whole 
dichotomy at that age. It was like, no, you have to play like this. And he would play, and Wah! it was Charlie Burns' first year in the orchestra in 86. Yeah. Yeah. And the band, it was always awesome. It was, but it was, you know. And so I'm hearing it, and I'm like, how do you stay relaxed and make that right. happen? Right. You know, because that's how we're feeling it in the audience. Yeah. Especially when we were way up top, you know. The only place we could afford to be. And you go, and then they would, boom! And, it was like, and you, you could feel it. Wham! Yeah. That's your chest. That's true. Um, and that they were, and then, but then you, like, I used to go with binoculars when I was that far up and, like, look at them. They're totally relaxed. Right. And the unanimity of the breath when it was time for the section to come in on a Bruckner or a Mahler or a Wagner moment. And you look all the way across it. <gasps> boom! That immediacy of sound. Ah, it was incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, so I was developing breathing exercises and then doing lots of things with, with free buzzing, very little, because I knew that it would, you know, if I did it for five minutes, I'd go play a Roshu. I, I sounded horrible. Yeah. Um, uh, but some of the things that he would, was on me about, about a leaky corner or anchoring my corners, was improving because I was free buzzing. Okay. So I had kept it a secret from him because, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to tell him I'm doing something he tells me not to do, so right. I'm just going to do it, and if he thinks it's going better, I'm just not going to say anything. Uh, until the until you know That's later great. on, and he's yeah. like, "Well, what's you doing? This is really going great." And I had a really bad leak on this side, and um, and the low register was always wonky because I didn't play low. I was playing solos in high school, so I was never playing below the staff. And um, uh, and I said, "Well, I'm doing this free buzzing. What for?" Uh, so I explained it, and I'm trying to anchor the corners. He's like, "Hmm, it seems like it's working, but you know, it's really not the right embouchure." I said, "No, I'm, I'm not doing it for the embouchure. I'm, I'm doing it for t to isolate my corners." Yeah. And then he would sort of, we need to talk about this more later. And I was like, and so we, and I, then I'd bring it up, and then, but then it was, we talked about it that week in the Marine Band. You're yeah. still free buzzing? Yeah. Let me hear you play. Okay. Okay. You know, same in Evanston, and I guess it was 96, 95, when Rex hosted that conference. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw him there, and the first question was, are you still playing C2? And the second question was, <laughs> so was your, are, you still, are, are you free buzzing? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I am, sir. <laughs> and he goes, well, you know, it really seems to be okay for you. And he's like, just, but you know what, you can't do it for very long. No, I, I know, I know, sir. I know. I think I think he encountered so many people who did it that and they had problems that were right. they were for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, I was uh, I'm in the, at the the macro level. It was an indication of his of his deep concern for all his students. Yes, that's great. You know, uh, uh, at University of Oregon, Dr. Frank Diaz is on our music education faculty, and his area of expertise is um, uh, the psychology of music. And uh, we, we've done a lot of uh, uh, talking about Mr. Jacobs, and he's aware of Mr. Jacobs, he's a trombonist, and he, uh, he says that uh, Jake had it right. Before the, all the fMRIs and all the, the modern day uh, diagnostic equipment, Jacobs um, and the brain, his ideas about the brain were correct. What do you, yeah. you, you you've done some of that. Yeah, exactly. Research. Well, I mean, you know, 1997 was the, was the breakout year for neuroscience. And they, Said, okay, the brain has plasticity. We, we can we can learn all this, you know, till we go in the hole, and uh, and uh, we can relearn and we can retrain our brain when things go aberrant. Um, and uh, he was on that already. He was retraining brains. All that's exactly how he worked with me. He was this. I was working in this neural pathway, which had was was connected to this kind of sound and this kind of approach, which was very tense. And he was shifting me over to a, a different one and it was a very slow frustrating process of retraining my brain and and, I, and now I think about the people that I know that have that have had neurological issues relating to, to their playing and have retrained themselves and recovered on the other side of it and they ta always talk about that the, the 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 beginning of every new retraining was a so frustrating, but it was an uh, indication of that your brain was doing it. It was doing the learning, and it was moving over to another neural pathway, and you were starting to connect and yeah. wrapping myelin, and it was getting easier and easier and easier to do. And of course, we didn't know about myelin, we didn't know about any of this stuff. And and uh, uh, it was an the opposite view in the scientific community. And Jake was was right on it. He was right on, like, no, no, no we're gonna, we're gonna. And I, and I think you know, by the time we got close to the '97. If anybody talked about training the brain to a musician or a music education person, they would kind of they would they were already in like, of course you can retrain the brain. People learn how to play an instrument when they're eighty, mm -hmm. you know. But we, we were already kind of logically there before the scientific community was going. Oh yeah, now the brain can be changed. But he, I felt like he was, whether he knew it or was just 
or prescient or just which he obviously was wildly intuitive um, uh, he was retraining he was making new neural pathways happen for people every single time he opened his mouth in a lesson yeah and he'd shift your brain over to another place and then all of a sudden you and it was it was you execute something magic it was what it's like the first time you hit a if you like to golf, the first time you hit the, the drive and it goes straight down the middle and a long way, that's it. You're hooked on golf for the rest of your life. It's the first time you made that C go, whoa, like that. That was it. And then all the rest of the week you tried to chase that. Yes. Before you came back for the lesson. Yes. Then you come back in like, I can't, I can't do it. And then you play and it's like, you sound great, but your ear had accommodated it. Yes. And that magic moment of the, the new pathway where things were unfettered and it just tumbled out of your, your body when you played, um, that was that... Like, how do I get back to Regenstein to practice? Because I wanted to have that moment. Because they were, they were, they were wildly, you know, super energetic, elated, but but in this calm, you know, sedate body that he was trying to elicit. And but in my brain would be just going. Right. And he would. I mean, he would talk about training the brain. He would talk about the brain works on percentages. Yeah. All these things. Yeah. Yeah. That, he was uh, on it. that uh, were not necessarily being talked about. By the medical people. Mm -mm. No. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. He's so well read. He was so re well read. Yeah, it was. I. I mean, I, I. That's another one to take away from the, the that his hobby was, you know, study of anatomy, and physiology, a lot of it, just general, and diseases in general. But uh, but especially the respiratory function side, and to, uh, to interesting to see, a wonderful artist have a passion that, um, supported the, propagation of his art. Yeah, when my own my own wife who passed away three years ago, when she was first diagnosed with hepatitis C, I called up in 1991. I called him up. It was only known for a couple of years. They had only identified in the late 80s hepatitis C. I called him up and I talked to him about it, and he knew all about it. He told me all about hepatitis C. That's just crazy. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, let's so. wait. Well, we should all aspire to uh, have the. You know, want to be putting information into our brains our whole lives like he did. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I remember uh, talking with Frank Byrne when I interviewed Frank. We were talking about uh, his effort to get Jacobs to the Marine Band yeah. for a week. Yeah. He came for a week. He did. And he worked with every section. Mm -hmm. What are you? What are your memories of that? Uh, of that? That week. Well, it was pretty fun. And there's um, that very famous picture of you on the on your on the floor with with Gizzy standing on your tummy. Standing on me. Yeah, I was. Uh, I thought that was you know my first publication that I appeared in was with my former teacher's wife on top of me. I thought it's like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it was exciting to uh, to from being in the band, knowing that we were going to have this sort of infusion because it would. Singers do a really great job. I was really taken when Pat Brody retired that his teacher of his whole life was standing right next to him when he announced his retirement. Singers are really good about keeping their mentors and keeping their teachers close and having a, a line of communication with them throughout their career once they get a job. I really feel like wind players, I don't know so much string players, but for sure wind players, um, we get a job and that's it. It's like now we go to work. Mm -hmm. And any sort of exchange or anything like that development uh, it, it, uh, it becomes a solitary journey and not one that is workshopped with like you did in Regenstein practice hall with yep. all your friends right you know that 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 room and the same thing at Arizona State for the year that I was there with all the colleagues that I had in the tuba studio there those were as powerful of teaching influences in my life mm -hmm. as the teachers yeah uh, so it was, it was great because I've been in the band I think two years maybe three years 91 and it was before Geneva because I was working on the music for the Geneva competition I think that was in 1991 so uh, I was yeah I'd been in the band maybe a year and a half almost two years and uh, so it was great to and I hadn't seen him in three or four so it was great to connect with him again and uh, for myself personally just to hear all the words again and go oh yeah that's that's where it's at and of course the great resource in Baltimore the entire time I was there, with James Urkel pointed out to me when I got into the band and stopped practicing and got into trouble after about four months, I was like, hey, I can't play. And Dave's like, just go see Federley. And that's, I still tell people, it's like, if you want to know what it was like to take a lesson with Mr. Jacobs, other than the, the package that is Dave that's different than Mr. Jacobs, mm -hmm. he's got it. Yeah. He, it, his, his 
the way that was. And so I, th I think I was in the lesson 10 minutes, and I was like, oh, this is just like sending with Jake. So yeah. awesome. Right. And, it, and everything went whoosh, right away, and, and I got, you know, paid practice. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, great. And, uh, and he's so direct, and uh, yes, so it was right, right back on track. And uh, so it was, I was happy to have that in the band, but I was also interested to see, because, you know, the Legacy of the Master had come out, and I'd run all this stuff for people that didn't play these instruments, and I never saw that. I only saw trombone and tuba players going into that office. Yeah. I knew that other people studied with him, but I hadn't ever seen him work with in that um, sphere before. So did, it was, you, did you attend the other classes? Oh, yeah, we were there all week. Because he worked with all the sessions? Everybody, yeah. yeah. No, it was fantastic, and um, uh, to to see what he would talk about based on an agenda, and then what he would talk about based on what he heard or what he saw, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, that was really helpful. Not only at 22, 23 years old to solidify, you know, where I was for myself at the time, but to sort of start to stuff away the the little, like this is what he noticed, and this is how he solved it. From a teaching standpoint, trying to come up with that, you know, yeah, enough pedagogical moxie to be able to, you know, try to imitate what he what he did so magically. I thought it was it was really amazing that that uh, you know whoever made the decision at the higher level, you know, to to do it, pay this guy, this retired geezer tuba player from some orchestra in the Midwest. Yeah. To come in and teach for a week, everybody that was that it must have raised an eyebrow or two somewhere along the chain of command, and uh, and then for him to do it, to be there the whole week, and uh, just must have been incredible. And I think uh, 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 for him to have a chance to work with with all of those sections, it must have been you know fantastic. It was, was it well received by the by the group? I think so. Yeah, I think so. It's a long time ago. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, it was a really, uh, uh, really great week, and it changed changed the sound of the band, but it definitely was uh, transformative for a lot of players and helped a lot of people that were in that mid or late career, I don't know, inertia. Yeah, sure. Um, find some momentum again and, uh, uh, and be able to find a center and do it stressless, Yeah, which was, uh, you know, the, always the macro message of the whole thing. And... Um, uh, th th it was it was great. I think the thing that I took from it the most, though, still to this day, uh, is that uh, you're supposed to do that. Just every the, the whole rest of the corporate world has uh, professional development, and you're required to hone your skills and refine them and learn new skills as yes. you go throughout your career. And we don't have anything like that. No. And um, and we should. In, in fact, maybe it's should. bad if we do. That's yeah. what people think. Yeah, yeah. That's like weakness or something. Yeah, right, exactly. And I, I again, that's I, I look over at the vocal side frequently in that regard um, and think, well, they got it right in that in the mentorship area and keeping a line of communication with your experts that got you to where you, that got you there um, was, was really important. And that was that was powerful for me to, to see him again. I had a job and... And uh, and to do what I was doing, and of course I, I did I sold it a lot with the Marine Band, and you know that's always that's always been my thing, and <laughs> it's, it's the same way. He's, every time I would see him, are you playing any C two guys? <laughs> you know, I feel, I feel, if I answer, you know, I, I feel like I was disappointing him so uh -huh. much. It's like, well, I'm not in an orchestra, Mr. Jake. What does it matter? <laughs> wow. But I only played E flat two before him once. It was that first lesson. That first lesson. That was it. Well, just looking back, if we can sum summarize, what what do you think would be the the, the main the main message that you got from him, if, if you can encapsulate encapsulate it into? That's not really my wheelhouse encapsulating. Um, I, I I we have three minutes for this segment. Tone, how to make it, how to be resonant, and how to hear it from behind the horn, because that was and when I first started, that was always, hey, did you hear the difference? And I, and I, you say I no. Was like, no. Yeah. Well, what did you what what? I felt a little easier. Go with easy this week. And they come back. Doesn't feel easier anymore. Yeah, I know you've accommodated. It. Now what do you, you know? And then I would find when I finally heard, then we could talk in the right area. But in the beginning, it had to be do with sensory subjective yeah. differences because I wasn't hearing the difference between a non-resonant note and one that would go yeah. boom in the room. Yeah. My ears weren't aware of that at that point. Right. Um, so that was the 
main awareness that I gained um, from him. And tone, 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 tone. Sing a song, sing a song, sing a song. It doesn't matter if it's a whole note at the end of the piece, sing a song. Yes. What is the word for that end of that chord? What do you mean it was a word? What is the song? How does the song end? Yes. Good. And and that is a, that is a message that I, well, it's it should be everywhere in music, but it's uh, especially important for bass players, for tuba players, because yeah. of our job function is to support melody. Yeah. And uh, he was, you know, trying to steep us in, like, well, if you're going to support it, you better be able to play it. Yeah. Well, certainly you do that, and you, you. you've done that very well. And uh, it's always a pleasure to hear. It was a pleasure to hear you last night. It's very kind. It was great. And um, you know, Puddles was there. He's up in the rafters. Oh, I know. He was flapping around up there. Is that what that sound was? Yes, yes, yes. But uh, he he wanted you to have this very special vintage of genuine University of Oregon duck nuts. <laughs> awesome! I really appreciate it. Where did he harvest them from? That's that's top secret. It's top secret. Top secret. Is that what the O stands for? No, the top secret says, says hear the O. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you. Patrick. You're man. welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Good to be here. And now back to you.